LWDG Pod Dog, the podcast that helps women train their gun dogs and become part of a supportive community. I'm Joanne Parrott, founder of the Ladies Working Dog Group, and I'm thrilled to be your host. Our online membership offers expert training, monthly courses, and live coaching sessions that empower women to become confident and skilled gun dog handlers. Join us as we share insights, advice, and stories to help you and your four-legged friend achieve your goals. So grab your headphones, sit back, and let's get started. Hello and welcome to another episode of LWDG Pod Dog. This week's podcast is all about adolescence and hormones in gun dog training. So welcome to everybody listening. I'd like to welcome our LWDG experts, Claire Denya and Gemma Martin. How are you this week, Claire? I'm very well, Claire. Thank you. How are you? I'm fabulous. And how are you, Gem? Yeah, all good. Back to our topic for this podcast. Let's start with a little bit around like understanding what adolescence is. Like I know a lot of us might be thinking, well, that's an obvious one. But what is adolescence in dogs? So adolescence is a part of the a dog's young sort of developmental stage. So it's the dog going from puppyhood into adulthood. It's that in between stage there's a lot going on for the dog during adolescence um, which kicks off for most dogs from around five months of age which seems very very young but i think when you put that into context about the lifespan of a dog um compared to the lifespan of your average human then it's no wonder that adolescence starts with a dog younger um, but yes, but from five months of age, your dog is going through a lot of hormonal changes, developmental changes. Um, the dog is still growing physically and mentally. Um, so there's a lot happening and breed dependent and size dependent of the dog um, will alter when that period of time is over for that dog. Some dogs seem to be in adolescence for longer than others. And typically with things like growing, the larger the breed, the longer that takes. So your smaller breeds tend to physically mature earlier than your larger breeds. And with that does come some maturity as well. Gemma, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think you've covered that really well, other than it can be a really, really difficult time for owners to deal with because they think that they've nailed certain things in training. Um, and then everything starts to sort of slowly unravel and they don't understand why. We've chatted a little bit about uh, adolescence. Let's talk a little bit about how it would affect a, any dog's behaviour, but how that's sort of like emphasised with a gun dog or, or why we see a more of a problem with a gun dog. So one of the things that I see um, with a lot of people with young gun dogs, especially people that um, are really into their gun dog training and they want to get out and do maybe puppy working tests. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of just touch on that briefly. So obviously there's an age limit to puppy working tests. So the, the owner will be trying to get their dog to a standard and a level as quickly as possible um, after six months of age to get the dog into a puppy working test. And that's all very well and good. And it's great to have those goals and, and want to achieve that. But we also do have to bear in mind that during that time that the dog um is going to be entered into those tests they are going through adolescence so we always say that adolescence in dog training and gun dog training um is like a roller coaster through adolescence so you'll feel like you have a few weeks that are going really really well everything's coming together and then they seem to have a blip or the dog seems more distracted than usual um and so if people are wanting to get out and compete with a very young dog because of wanting to do let's say work in tests there's going to be quite a bit of pressure on that dog to be able to perform to a certain standard to do well in working tests and i think we have to sometimes take a step back and say why is this going wrong why is the dog not ready and it's as i say it's great to have those goals but also we shouldn't be surprised when things maybe don't go as expected yeah i think exactly that and our expectations of gun dogs are sometimes much higher than they would be if they were like a family pet or or something like that we want all their training to almost be sort of robotic by the time they're one there's almost like this golden age of one that they should be 
fully trained at and ready to then go on and do some work or tests or trials and things. Um, and we've discussed it before in, I think there was a podcast called The Age Race or something that we did, wasn't there? That I think we often put far too much pressure on our dogs and that we really need to take things at their own pace and every dog is going to be different. And I think we say this day in, day out on our podcast, our masterclass is and everything that we talk about. Um, and it's very much that dog's and your the handler's own training journey. So like you said there, Claire, if a dog isn't ready, a dog isn't ready. Um, and actually putting that much pressure on them can actually set them back in the long run and make your end target move further away. And putting that much pressure on them as well can cause frustration for the handler on the, on the, and the owner. Um, which then can have a negative impact on the dog's performance as well. And it becomes quite a vicious cycle. And I'm always saying to owners all the time um, with young dogs, we want to be very careful that we don't squash a young dog's desire to retrieve or to hunt nicely for us by taking all the fun out of it too quickly. And I think that's one of the challenges with adolescence. It's knowing when the dog is being cheeky or maybe affected by its hormones and, and we're going to talk about some of those things that can happen a bit later on aren't we but when it's that or when the dog is just being a bit cheeky or when they're just a bit distracted so it's the owner having the ability to read what's happening with the dog and have a little bit of an understanding but without letting them take the mickey as well and i think this is that fine line and balance is knowing how to educate the dog and to progress with the dog but without being the fun police taking all the fun out of it but equally without putting too much pressure on the dog that the dog lose drive as well because drive is a really important part for people especially in gun dog training i think what you're talking about there is massively important for owners to understand and there's almost like this sort of clash, isn't there? We have goals that we want to achieve with our dogs, but when a dog starts adolescent, adolescence, their body almost has goals, like mature in itself and mm -hmm. getting ready for the future. And we sort of like are along ahead a little bit because the dog maturing is far more important than what we want to do. And the dog maturing in a way of i want to develop a dog that's quite robust and strong in personality so um and i think for me that's always been very important because indy after she was attacked becoming very sensitive to things and having to overcome a lot since that with her every dog that i bring through myself um and i want this for my clients dogs as well is that they're bringing on dogs that are really robust and strong inside that enjoy the work and are not afraid to give things a go and i think part of that is building the dog up and i think getting frustrated with the dog's behaviors through adolescence doesn't really help that and doesn't really support that um, and can knock the dog's confidence because they're like i just seem to not be able to get this right and especially i think if you look at young young male dogs and there are absolutely hormonal things going on for males and females but the way that I describe it to clients with a male dog is it's almost like it's got um, an inner voice chatting away in the back of its head. Um, it wants to do the retrieve. It wants to please you, but there's this little nagging head in the background going, oh, but wait, was, was there a female around here? Oh, is another boy been here? Can I like just put my mark in that area? So it's like an inner voice that they're up against. So it's quite a challenge. Yeah, and I think it's a real frustration for owners isn't it especially if the dogs are really really on it one day and then the next day they're off like having a sniff and ignoring a recall or ignoring a dummy just to go off and have a wee but I think we forget that so much is going on inside their bodies and their brains like you say they've got their little inner monologue that happily plays yeah. along um we forget that they're still not physically mature yet either so a lot of their energy is going into growing and developing muscles and bones and growth plates and all that stuff and that's tiring i mean i think we forget when we were growing up as kids that actually we used to sleep quite a lot or i did maybe that was just me maybe i was lazy <laughs> but i don't think our dogs 
as they get older, I mean, we're very conscious as puppies that they get that downtime, aren't we? But then as they get older, I don't think we're so conscious of the dogs getting enough rest and downtime. So, <clears throat> sorry. So even now, my dogs will still have a couple of days off training a week that they just are allowed to be dogs and chill out and we'll go for some walks because it's so easy, like you were saying, Claire, to just start squashing that drive a little bit, especially with dogs that maybe aren't natural, really drivey retrievers. If you just pile it home and get a bit grumpy with them about something, some dogs out of those 10 dogs will just go, oh, do you know what? I don't really want to do it. You do it. Mm, um, yeah. And you start losing that lovely drive to go out and get that dummy. And then again, the frustration builds up in the handler and you end up with a handler that's grumpy and a dog that just doesn't want to do the job and would rather go off sniffing because it's more fun. Oh, it's something that we see really, really commonly. And um, one of the things, well, there were a few things that came to mind when I was thinking about this conversation was people forget about the teething phase, which is still happening during adolescence until the dog is seven months of age they're still teething that you know they've still got things going on in the mouth and sometimes that can cause retrieving issues the dog becomes more mouthy or even doesn't want to pick things up because of the teething and then you've got obviously for a female um from six months of age they could have their first season at any point from there so there's all the hormone changes that are going on through there and some females are really really affected by their seasons aren't they um more than others some some seem to kind of drift in and out of seasons with not too much fuss and others are really affected um but i think the teething and the fact they're still growing and i've seen quite a few larger breed dogs where um they've had intermittent lameness as well during adolescence because of growing pains and things like that so i think there's just so many things we need to consider and not always just think oh is the dog just being naughty today you know is there a genuine reason and that's not making excuses for the dogs but it's being understanding and having the ability to perhaps look more with an outside pair of eyes inward instead of just judging your dog in that moment but what is going on with that dog at the moment um so i think that's always worth considering those little bits and pieces that could be happening especially if something suddenly happens out of the blue especially for me with young dogs that are under seven months if they suddenly start displaying a behavior on a retrieve that maybe wasn't there i might be thinking oh and checking the mouth and just seeing like is anything going on in there with the teething so what about you jen do you see sort of things like that with your, the younger dogs that you work with yeah we see all of that type of stuff and uh, the other thing i've sort of found more recently is i think it's probably more so with male dogs but if they've got a handler that's very sort of verbal with them when they're young and they get shouted at a lot and they get grumbled at a lot i find the male dogs almost become a bit thick-headed to it they're like yeah whatever i don't care so your verbal correction that you might have done as a pup, which worked really well, by the time they're a year old, they're so done with it that they're like, yeah, and? Um, <clears throat> and I think that's really hard to get through to some owners that actually you just need to take it easy. You don't need to rant and rave at them. You just need to show them this is the right way, this is the wrong way, and actually be a bit lenient in some respects with their training, because some of it is going to be down to them having all these hormonal changes, having all these development stages, and I think for some owners, it's really hard to distinguish between what's naughty behavior and what's them just trying to sort of suss out the world again in their new sort of hormonal growing state. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think though, if we look at like <clears throat> recognizing the changes, if you think of a, a human child, you know, it's very easy to see probably what stage of the development they are at roughly by by how they look. So okay we get frustrated with teenagers and there's loads of like stereotypes of teenagers but we are very aware that they are in that teenage phase and we do make allowances for behavior like for example if my son's drumbling first thing in the morning at like eight o'clock i don't think oh now is my time to correct him i just think just leave him to it now let him come round to bed because i'm allowing for the fact that he is a teenager but i think when you look at a 
happy suddenly one minute it's like really happy looking and it's really cute and small and we're very very over the top loving and and kind way and then we sort of sort of flip they hit six months old they're hitting adolescence and we suddenly go oh you're you're a dog now and they're not are they 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 teenagers yeah absolutely that and i think this is where actually a trainer can help you because when you're the handler in the situation, it can be very easy to get frustrated or to think, oh, the dog did this fine yesterday. Why is it not doing it today? Um, but looking at things like, so for instance, if a client comes to me and says, with a young dog, so I'm talking about a dog under eight, nine months of age here. So let's just say they say, oh, at home, he in the garden, I can throw a retrieve out and it brings it back really nicely. But here i get a little bit of shoot show boating or he's doing this or he seems more distracted well firstly maybe where you're training with me is more distracting to the dog maybe the fact we're on a working farm and there's the sheep in the field two fields over and the goats breaking out of their field another two fields over and or even just the fact that i'm there in the scenario i'm somebody to show off to sometimes so it's understanding those things and it's also where a trainer can help you to see the difference between well he's just a little bit distracted so just make a little bit of noise getting back on track getting to look at you um or okay yes that is being naughty we don't want him to get into a habit of scent marking because especially if you want to do working tests you do dog scent marks you know zero straight away so where a trainer can say okay that is scent marking that's not having a pee that scent marking. So a trainer can help you to understand what's going on with a young dog um, and help you to understand how to and when to correct inappropriate things and equally how to and when to encourage the dog and use a bit of enthusiasm so that the dog doesn't feel like they're being bullied or the fun's being taken out of the scenario. So I think a trainer can really help you from a different perspective to understand what's happening because it is so difficult in the moment yourself to not get frustrated or feel disappointed if something that your dog did in the garden yesterday today they're not doing it in the same way but then bear in mind when you come to a training field um there might have been five or six dogs there before that dog so the dog will be picking up on the scent of all the other dogs while often say let your dog have a little toilet break then let them have a little sniff around and then and then we'll start training so especially with a young dog so we let them get that little bit of curiosity out of the way before we start with the training does that make sense guys yeah absolutely how is it best though for an owner to recognize and adapt the training techniques you think Jen? I, don't, I suppose it all boils down to knowing your dog as well, doesn't it? Every dog's going to be slightly different. Some are going to be cheekier than others. And I think as handlers, we just need to be in that sort of fluid state of what we're doing today. The moment we go out with a set plan for a youngster of what we're going to train is the moment that that frustration creeps in for both sides, because it might be a bad day. You might be having a bad day. Your dog might be tired your dog might be you know super aroused by something that's going on in the environment so I think going out with an open mind on what you're going to do and being able to adapt that and know how to sort of almost bring your dog back to a base level so like Claire was saying like go and let it have a sniff go and let it have a wee decompress a bit then come back and start again so don't keep sort of trying to hammer the point home if it's going wrong make it easier, do something else, take the dog's mind off it, take your mind off it. And that's where I always use my rule of thumb for when to correct the dog with owners. I will say if something's gone wrong twice on the third attempt, change something, make it shorter, make it easier. Um, do something to set the young dog up for success. Don't keep, because the more times you repeat something and it goes wrong or the dog does a behavior incorrectly, but maybe it's self-rewarding for the dog. So although you don't like showboating for the dog, that might be quite self-rewarding running around with the dummy showing it off to you. Um, so the more times the dog repeats that behavior, the more likely that that's going to become a bad habit that then you are going to have to correct. So instead of letting the dog continually repeat the same behavior, change something. So that's why I always say to people, it goes wrong twice, 
change something don't let that keep repeating change something make it shorter make it easier put the dog in a retrieving run put a long line on stand with your back to effect you know there are so many things so it's giving giving um owners options that they can then play with is important like because as Jem just said not one way works for all dogs and this goes for all training whether it's gun drug training obedience training puppy training behavioral training all of those things not one thing works for every dog so having a multitude of options for an owner to try and to play with is the key but they do need to try that thing consistently for a little while to actually get change so for me it's always give them some options to play with let them know what to do but make sure that they understand that this is a young dog it's going through hormonal changes it's going through adolescence there's a lot of stuff going on so don't take the fun out of it with regards to consistency which you sort of just touched upon there we we talk all the time about the importance of consistency in gun dog training full stop but right now it is really 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 important that we stay steady isn't it yeah it doesn't help the dog or the owner if you lose your mind and, and just keep on changing tact or you know you you do need to give the dog guidance and that's what it is it's giving the dog guidance on this is what i want from you and make sure you reward that people are really really quick to stop rewarding adolescent dogs and i never understand that like okay I'm, I'm probably an over rewarder i'm gonna put my hands up and say that i love to reward my dogs um i have whether that's verbal praise or play or giving them a food reward especially in training because if you're going to go and do a working test with your dog obviously you can't reward the dog so i want to have built up enough value in what i'm asking the dog to do but for some reason people are really really keen to get rid of rewards as quickly as possible we even have people in puppy classes ask that question they say when can i get rid of the rewards well i will then turn around to a puppy owner and say when do you want your boss to stop paying you <laughs> and when i say that that usually gets them to go all oh, right so i say like don't think reward doesn't mean food reward is anything that that young dog deems rewarding so it could be that you use their face so a spaniel you might release them to, from heel work into having a sniff of the long grass because they find that rewarding it doesn't have to be about food but we have to be rewarding the dogs for the behaviors that we want more of i think i'd be quite rich by now if i had a, a pound or two for every time someone said oh but they're only doing it for the treats but trying to explain to people that the treats or or the reward or whatever is the motivator for that dog and we're pairing whatever they're doing with that so that they find that thing rewarding um can be really difficult for some people and they like you say they just want to get rid of everything as soon as possible and almost have this little robot that just responds to whatever they've asked it to do um and like you Claire I think I probably reward my dogs far too much um and still they will get a reward every time they bring a retrieve back, whether that's a big fuss or a play or a treat, because I want to keep that drive in there. I want to keep them gunning to go out for it. Um, and they're like, what are they now? Two and five. So they're not young. <laughs> but I look how much our dogs love what they do. Yeah, I think you've only got to look at videos of you working your dogs, Joe working her dogs, me working my dogs, Sam working, you know, us guys working our dogs and using rewards in a way that the dogs appreciate not just giving them food for the sake of giving them food but our dogs look happy when they're working they look happy when they're working and i think the problem is i don't think it's a problem i think that's the wrong word maybe um you might want to correct me in a minute ladies but i think when i look at what i see a lot of happening especially in the gun dog training sector actually in any dog sport sector actually i think yeah this is what i think i think everybody wants to get onto the cool serious stuff really really quickly especially if they want to compete whatever that dog sport is but we're specifically talking about gun dog training they want to get onto the stuff that looks very cool which is technically more challenging and more serious and when you see videos on social media of a lot of trainers doing that kind of stuff, 
You don't very often, unless it's one of us <laughs> or some of our friends that are, are trainers, don't very often see the rewards happening, do you, actually? You just see a really polished looking exercise. And I think people see that and go, oh, and it needs to look like that. What do you think, Jen? No, I think you're definitely right. I think the only sport that you probably see the rewards happening in is agility because they always have that throw of the toy at the end, don't they? And that's what yeah. they're around for. But when you look at this high level obedience or, or whatever, where these dogs are like stuck to these people's sides and doing backwards and forwards and whatever, you never see the fuss because that's all off camera at the end. And I think that's probably quite hard for some people that they, they don't mm. understand it fully. If we think about humans and then we think about dogs, we can get an idea much quicker. When a, a kid is little, you've only got to say, oh, do you want to go to the park? And they're like, yeah. They're like hyper, they're so excited by it because it was something fascinating. But then you get to a teenager and you go, oh, do you want to go to a park? And they're like, hell no. But then, you know, you might ask them to do something. Like I could say to my kids when they were little, when they were five, oh, do you want to play with the hoover? And they go, yeah, and they'll have a little go with you because they're all excited. And you say to them, do you want to play with the hoover as a teenager? And they say, how much? Because it's the same <laughs> thing. But their hormones mean they don't value it. It's not so much they've changed, their hormones have said, what's in it for me that's going to be more interesting than sitting watching TV or reading a book or scrolling through social media. And even if you look at us as adults, when we come in from work and we have a glass of wine or something, we find a way to self-reward ourselves for actually even getting through the day. Yeah, absolutely that. And I think you just touched on something super important there and you will hear people and it's absolutely right for um, gun dogs, whether that's the spaniels hunting or retrievers retrieving or whatever. Um, when they're an adult, a grown adult, and even when they're tiny little puppies, I think the actual act of doing the retrieve or doing the hunting to find the thing is self rewarding. But during that period of adolescence, when the hormones are kicking in and the little inner voice is chatting away, I think that's the challenging time because there's a lot of other things that that dog wants to go and investigate, wants to go and try doing that challenge that innate behavior, that challenge that innate desire to do the thing. There's the hormonal stuff going on that interferes with that. But once you get through that, 100% for most dogs doing the job is rewarding. That doesn't mean we have to stop rewarding them, but doing the job is rewarding. But during adolescence, there's a hell of a lot of other stuff going on for the dog that interferes with that feeling. I think that maybe it's like, well, you touched about, upon this uh, you know, a little while ago in this podcast though. They've got all this growing going on. Their body is, is is growing so quickly, maturing so quickly, everything inside them that maybe you're not completely seeing it all, but it's, it's all developing at such a high speed. It's almost a bit of a, I can't be asked to do what you want me to do right now because I'm just doing this thing for me. Is, is it a case of that we've just got to sort of step back and go, actually, right now, I'm going to ask you to do stuff. I'm not going to ask for it so many times. And I'm not going to be so perfect on it. I'm just going to work with you through what is an incredibly hard time for you. One of my top tips on that question, Joe, is leave the dog wanting more. Don't overtrain the dog. And so that training time, that time frame that you can train the individual dog for will vary very much from dog to dog through adolescence. But my biggest tip for that to get through what you've just said is to leave the dog wanting more. So do enough to get something nice, but don't keep pushing and pushing until the dog's bored and then that inner voice interferes again. Leave the dog wanting more. Exactly that. And I think that's something we say to our clients a lot, particularly with the retrieving, because you see it go wrong so quickly when they've just made the dog's dead bored of doing it and we've all been there I think when we've done an amazing retrieve and we think oh we'll just do one more um and then that retrieve goes wrong so definitely leave them wanting more um short sharp 
little training sessions that are super fun and engaging for the dogs when they're going through adolescence because you you just don't want to make it boring because we know that at that age they're going to find a lot more exciting than us and training with us so try and make it as engaging as possible keep it short keep it sweet and like claire says keep them wanting more so on the one side we we are saying keep chilled allow for what's going on but then on we are very aware on the other side we do not let them take the absolute proverbial either because again it's that balance isn't it you i'm going to be a little bit calmer with you kiddo but on the other side don't take the mick out of me that that is 100 percent it and it's finding that balance and it's understanding don't don't make excuses for the dog but do understand the dog and set the dog up for success build desire build drive leave them wanting more but don't let unwanted things become a bad habit that later on you're going to have to try and rectify because that's much much harder than taking it easy and working with the dog through that adolescent phase yeah and I think we spoke about it Joe in that podcast we did about boundaries at home I think if you can keep a lid on all of the sort of behaviors you expect of your adolescent dog at home uh, use your training sessions for doing those little things that you need them to work on and keeping it fun I think you can keep those boundaries a lot more under control um, and make sure that those unwanted naughtiness isn't sort of slipping in and being sort of ignored through adolescence We've got a fantastic masterclass on neutering. So for people who want to like really go into that, um, that's there for you. But one of the things I always see on social media is, oh, my dog is hitting Adleth and shall I go spay, shall I go neuter? Like, like this, like, you know, stopping all of the hormones is going to solve the problem. That mm. really isn't the case, is it? No, th there are only a couple of behaviours which neutering or spaying will improve and I, and still they shouldn't be done until a dog is fully grown um, and fully matured physically and mentally, in my opinion, um, because the hormones are there for a reason. There are a couple of behaviours which are more, they're quite rare behaviours to see in terms of the behavioural work I see, most of the behavioural problems I see are fear-based or something like that. They're very rare, rarely a really truly dominant aggressive dog. Um, and we know that neutering a male dog who is that way inclined in the right circumstances, that like I'm not sitting here, I'm not gonna sit here and say, neuter a dog that has this behavior because for that dog that might not be the right thing but there are a couple of behaviors where in certain circumstances and incident incidences incidences i can't say that word instances there you go um, <laughs> there you go I could get through a podcast without one word going very wrong could i but anyway <laughs> um instances where we may recommend neutering for that dog alongside very specific behavior modification and training program however for an adolescent dog there's a lot of risk in neutering or spaying the dog too young you are affecting hormones that are there to aid growth and stopping of growth and hormonal development and um the dog building you know i mentioned earlier about building a strong dog if you've got a dog that is very very fearful um anxious nervous tendencies fearful type behaviors and you neutral spay that dog you are very 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 likely in fact i haven't seen a dog yet where this isn't the case when i've worked with dogs that are fearful and have been neutered or spayed the behavior becomes worse because you're taking away the hormones that give the dog confidence so actually you can make a lot of behaviors um, that are fear-based or anxiety-based worse by neutering and spaying but for a young dog you very likely are going to also have issues because you've taken away hormones that are part of the development and growth of that dog Jem, is there anything you want to add on that? I think, unfortunately, for whatever reason, although I've heard more and more that vets aren't doing it, 
a lot of vets are very keen to get the dog spayed or, or castrated as soon as they're sort of six, seven months old. Um, and we quite often have clients come and say, oh, what do you think about it? I think for me, I would leave a dog almost as long as possible. So boys, I would probably leave till three, girls probably three as well, actually, um, as a minimum, because I think the hormones in development, like you said, are really important, not only for their growth plates and everything to form properly and nice solid joints and bones and whatever, but I think if we spay the dogs too early before they're mentally mature, they almost get stuck in a, a permanent puppy palace. Yeah, permanent puppy <laughs> space. Um, and they're almost a bit silly. We often get clients ask about um, will spaying or castrating their dog calm them down. Now we all know that that's not going to happen. That usually those dogs just have a lack of self control and they haven't been taught the boundaries that they need to be taught. Um, but unfortunately where they go and read things online and things they see castration and neutering as the sort of solution to all these problems and that when that happens their dog's suddenly going to be this reformed character but um what we have found is quite good when claire was talking about obviously it can have a bad effect on behavior if we do castrate anxious dogs and whatever with the chemical castration, it's not a permanent thing. So if that does go a little bit AWOL and it doesn't work quite as we expect, it's not a permanent thing. The dogs can regain those hormones that they were maybe relying on for that behavior and they can come back. So if you are a bit unsure on whether to castrate your dogs, then go to your vet and talk about that chemical castration because it can be a nice sort of almost try before you buy option if you're a bit worried about that. I think I think the other thing to just maybe add on while we're on that subject that we didn't talk about yet is dogs can go through a second fear phase any time between six months of age and, and around 14 months of age, you know, depending on who you speak to and what you read that that time frame can differ a little bit, but they can go through a second fear phase. And if you were to spay or neuter the dog during that time when they're going through that second fear phase, you know, that could again exasperate that problem um, because you're removing the hormones that are giving the dog strength of character um, and confidence. Um, so that is also a risk. So I always say to people, if they're considering um, neutering or spaying their dog, I will firstly say, do you have any behavioural problems that are going on that should be considered first? Is there a medical reason for getting that dog neutered or spayed? Because sometimes there is a medical reason. Um, and obviously in older dogs with bit, with um, females, I like to say females instead of the B word at the moment, because I know that people don't like that word sometimes. But anyway, <laughs> um, with some females, uh, <laughs> I forgot. Oh, the risk of pyo, pyometra goes up as the dog gets older. But obviously in a young dog, the risk of that is incredibly low. So I think it's always for me, if somebody wants to get my advice on spaying and neutering, I will ask if there's a medical reason why, are there behaviour problems that, you know, they should be considering that are for and against um, and, and what their real reasons are and checking that the dog is, is if unless there's a medical reason that the dog is fully grown mentally and physically before making that decision. It is quite baffling the difference in attitudes between look at gynecologists or again for humans they are very reluctant to to sterilize someone because of changes in hormones changing in life circumstances changes in everything yeah. Right here. and then you look at the uh the veterinary practice and it seems so fast before you've even got a dog that's maybe old enough to go through that thing and i think for people, and whilst you can maybe think, and I've had dogs spayed myself, looking back, I think, was I doing it to suit me or to suit mm. them? And I'm I'm not so sure. As my knowledge has grown, I think where I am now, I would be very reluctant, unless it was for a medical reason, to spay or neuter anything, because it doesn't make the changes we think it's going to make all the time and we cannot know the absolute outcome and i think that's the thing it's always going to be a gamble there's never a guarantee that it's going to improve this or or that you know it is a gamble so i think that's why we have to consider all factors before making those decisions based on the individual dog for sure 
so I think this has been another fantastically um, interesting podcast. Uh, thank you to the listeners for tuning in. Thank you to the experts for being amazing as always. We have mentioned a couple of masterclasses and other podcasts that you might want to go listen to. So please make sure to subscribe. Podcasts are now on week one and week three of every month on Fridays. So hopefully you can enjoy them, love them as much as everybody else does. For those of you who are members, you also have additional podcasts on your private podcast. Uh, thank you all for listening and we hope to speak to you all next week. Thank you for listening to LWDG Pod Dog with Joanne Parrott, founder of the Ladies Working Dog Group. If you're interested in joining our supportive community and taking advantage of our group experts training and resources, please visit our website at www.thelwdg.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a review. And we look forward to helping you and your four-legged friend thrive. Until next time, keep training, keep learning, and keep working with your beloved gun dog. Thank you.